Welcome to The Joys of Binge Reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. Emily Huber's dark gothic themed Lady Derby mysteries have attracted a strong following and won awards, but she's not one to rest on her laurels. Hi there, I'm your host, Jenny Wheeler, and today Anna talks about her new mystery hero. World War I spy Verity Kent. She explains why she's also started Gothic Mist, a new romantic suspense series, and tells of the one thing that more than any other is the secret to her success. But before we talk to Anna, just a reminder that the show notes for this episode are available on the website thejoysofbingereading.com. That's where you'll find links to Anna's website and books, as well as details about how to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. But now, here's Anna. Hello there, Anna, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Look, Anna, from what I've read of you, you've always loved to write. But what got you started on historical mysteries? And was that the first fiction that you tried your hand at as a writer? Well, actually, um, I started out writing straight historicals. Um, I've always been fascinated with history. Um, And so when I uh, was an adult and and went back to writing after some years, um, I realized I was definitely going to have to be a historical setting. Um, My first attempt at a book, though, I kept having mystery and romance and all these other things sneak in and, and it wasn't a very, it ended up not being a very good book because I didn't structure it correctly. Um, and then I actually tried to write historical romance, but the mystery kept overtaking the plot. (laughs) (laughs) So I realized, okay, let's switch this. Let's try writing historical mystery and then have the romance as more of the subplot. And that's kind of what I realized was the perfect fit for me. It was what I actually enjoyed reading the most. So I should have probably clued into that earlier, but (laughs) um, I also enjoy historical romance. So yeah, that's great. And, And even just winding back a bit, why did you also go straight to the historical? Uh, I don't, I guess I, I, well, I read contemporary also. Uh, I, I don't know. I just like history so much. Um, and when I write, I feel like my voice is more of a historical fit. Um, I, I'd love to try my hand at writing a contemporary. Um, but I don't know. It just seems such so natural to me. And it's what I, what interests me the most. Um, most of my plot ideas would work better historically than, um, contemporary. So I guess, I guess that's the reason. I don't know. It's your natural (laughs) fit. It it is. Yes. Yeah. Now your award-winning Lady Derby series is rather dark. It's on the dark side. I think you would probably almost call them gothic, would you? Yes. Yes. And set in 1830s Scotland. Now, what led you to that period and setting? Well, I came up with the idea for Kira, the character, first. Um, and I'd realized um, I wanted to write a historical mystery with a female protagonist, um, but I wanted to give her some kind of skill that she could actually bring to the investigations. Um, I wanted her to kind of be awkward socially, so not be the natural social butterfly. Um, so how could she, you know, how could she you know, investigate these crimes, what would she bring to it? Um, and that's when I stumbled across the idea of giving her knowledge of, um, anatomy, you know, which she gains by force, you know, from her first husband. But, um, then I started looking into history and 19th century has always been a big draw for me. And I realized that, um, Burke and Hare are, uh, arrested in 1829. And so that was kind of the perfect setting because of that scare about the body snatchers and everything that was coming out about what the anatomists were doing in order to teach, you know, their pupils and to advance science, um, in the medical 
um, industry. And also the um, Anatomy Act is coming up in 1832. So it was that perfect setting time slice to use. Um, Also, Regency England tends to have a lot of books set in it and later Victorian does, but 1830 is not used very often, but it's such a fascinating period with so much upheaval. Um, And so I thought this this can be my little niche. I'm going to set it right here. And um, have you been to Scotland and and done the research on the ground? Because the stories seem to have a very strong sense of geographic location. Yes, I have been to Scotland. Um, I've been to a lot of the places that I write about. There's a few that I I haven't been able to make it to, but um, setting is really important to me to be able to ground it in yeah. where you are. That's the you know all the senses and the just the feel of a place. Every place evokes a different feeling, whatever it happens to be. Yes, yes, yeah. And what was the reception like um, for Lady Darby at the beginning? At the beginning, it was um, it was good, but it was obviously a you know a do- debut author. Um, you know, I didn't get a huge you know budget for promotion, which is is pretty common. Um, but it kind of gradually you know started you know gathering followers, and um, each book was you know a bigger and bigger release. Um, so I would say it's it was a pretty normal debut author experience um, that you kind of have to just build on itself. I would encourage people that you know that are r- wanting to write. You know, uh, most authors don't get a big blowout on their first book. You know, it's it's building that audience and building that you know that career up. Sure, and it says something because of the subject matter being a little bit dark. It would require a particular type of reader, but I'm sure that those readers would also be very loyal readers. Yes, I, I found that my lo- my readers are very loyal, and they're they're amazing. They're the best in the world, and uh, you know, and I I'm drawn to that gothic tone. Um, and I I know there's a lot of other people that are that are drawn to that. They're you know they're they're darker. They're not gruesome. They're not you know um, graphic, but they're definitely darker than your you know cozy. Yeah, your average cozy. Yes, sure. And then you you did change tone quite markedly for the next series, your post World War One series, the Verity Kents. Um, that yes. that features a. a a heroine quite different from Kira in many ways, a, a sort of smart set gal who's been a First World War spy, which is quite a fascinating um, thing to <laughs> set up as well. But the tone of those is quite different. Tell me about moving from one to the other and how that came about. Well, I have always been fascinated with World War One. I'd always wanted to set a series there, but it's very tricky because you're getting into 20th century where uh, you know, there's so much more known, um, and there's so much more research involved, and and you know, World War One can be such a complicated, you know, subject. I wanted to get it right. It was really important to get it right, and I also couldn't find the right right way to approach it. And then I stumbled across in my research um, a lot of information about um, the British Secret Service and you know the women that had served, and I never heard about any of it. And it was so fascinating, you know, the hundreds, thousands of women that served, um, that you know. Really Really haven't gotten their due that we, we don't know about, um, and and in in studying about them, it kind of helped me craft Verity, um, my heroine, uh, and it kind of the plot grew from there. And it was a lot of fun to kind of research a different era, even if it's a, a darker era. Also, you know, with all the sadness following World War One, but you're also getting into the twenties and all of you know that that craziness and. Uh, you know, the language is kind of fun to play with. There's such a rhythm to the language during that time period. Um, so it was it was kind of a breath of fresh air to be able to switch back and forth between time periods so that they didn't grow stale. Yes, and, you know, I was amazed. I honestly did not realize either that they had women spies as early as World War One. Obviously, we know about World War Two, but, and you say hundreds, perhaps even thousands were involved. Yes, Um the different military intelligence agencies, you know, in Britain, you know, there was, you know, several, I could name them off, but they all had varying degrees of women involved. Um, for example, MI, what became MI5, the, you know, um, home security service, you know, they had a division called the registry, which they kept, you know, indexes on all the residents and foreigners in Britain that had any connection to Germany that, you know, they were 
wondering if they had its any spying or conflicts of interest going on. And it was a it was a huge registry, and it was it was actually manned, you know almost exclusively by women, hundreds of women. Um, there were women, you know, in every branch, even MI, what became MI6, the, you know, foreign division, um, you know, they were abroad in the offices, um, the field offices that, uh, that were in, you know, Rotterdam, um, Holland and um, Paris, France and places like that. And they also worked behind the scenes. There were several um, intelligence gathering networks at work in the German occupied areas that had thousands of women in them that were gathering intelligence for the allies and sending it through the British Secret Service into Holland. Um, so, so many women involved that, you know, most people have no clue about when you say spies in World War One and women, you say Mata Hari. That's the only one everyone knows yeah. about, who was a horrible failure. <laughs> so, you know, and, and a very, you know, not the norm, um, really, of the women that served. So um, it was really it, it fascinating, but also important to me when I started writing let, to let people know about these women and, you know, what they did for, you know, the cause of the Allies. Yes, and and uh, the book does have a wonderful twist two-thirds of the way in that we won't reveal for those who have not yet read it, but a, a very surprising twist that obviously then influences the rest of the series. You you obviously love to do those those plot turns as well. Yes, I do. Um, and it's funny because when I write, sometimes I don't intend to have them. Um, but as I'm writing along, and a- actually this side of murder, the first book, um, there's two, you know, I would consider them plot twists. I know the one main one you're talking of yeah. that I didn't originally plan oh, to write. Oh, is that right? And <laughs> It, I yeah I, I was just writing the book and then all of a sudden this happened and it was like oh this is so much better than what I planned <laughs> <laughs> so I just went with it and uh, you know so I like to have that leave myself some of that flexibility with my writing because those moments happen and um, I, a lot of times I feel like they make the story much better than it would have been before yes yes how important is it to you to be historically accurate and how much poetic license do you allow yourself? I try very, very hard to be historically accurate. Um, There's some instances where it's really hard to find the information I need. And so I end up having to fudge it. I hope that if I can't find it, then no one can find it. And so I do did my due diligence. Um, But it is really important for me to try to get it right. Um, When I do change something, I usually try to, you know, make a note in my historical note about that. Um, And with language, even I try very hard to make sure I'm using, you know, language for that time period. But it's so tricky. You know, the etymology, I always get caught out in one or two instances, at least every book, just because, you know, there's so many words we use nowadays, we think, oh, this is really ancient, and it's not. So, um, or a turn of phrase, or, you know, you just don't even catch it when you write it. So, uh, so yeah, I try very hard, um, you know, and I try to give myself that grace for things that I just can't find because the book has to be written. You know, I can't just spend all my time doing research. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And you've got the second one of the Verities it came out just a few months ago, I think, didn't it? Yes, end of September, correct. Treacherous is the night. Yes. And the the fashion for those must be fun to write too. I mean, you can't do the 1920s without talking about the clothes, can you? Exactly. (laughs) Yes. And it's great because Verity is such, she's in the smart set. She's, you know, into clothing and fashion and stuff. So it's a lot of fun, especially because it's that, just that beginning of it where, you know, people, the old, you know, the old guard is saying, no, don't bob your hair, you know? (laughs) Um, And and she's more, you know, she's young and, and, you know, fresh. And so she, she's getting into all the the trends and things. Um, So yeah, that's a lot of fun. And both Verity and Kira, they've got quite a few personality traits in common in sense of strong, independent, and a little enigmatic as well. I get the feeling you like writing those sorts of female characters, do you? I do, I do. Um, I find, you know, I've had people say that I write very feminist characters, and um, I don't really think of them that that way. They end up being that way, but I'm, I'm really interested in writing about women who are trying to find, you know, their happiness and their place in a society that 
is telling them that they need to be a certain way and, and they don't know how to be that way. Um, they can't just be Susie Homemaker. They're, there's something else in them that's driving them to do something different. Um, and so I like, you know, I like exploring, you know, people that are extraordinary in very ordinary ways. Yes, and I think that probably when you look back into history, in almost every period, women have had actually quite a bit more agency perhaps than what we think when we when we look back exactly yes exactly we're always finding instances of you know things that they did you know everyone thinks of the victorians as being so prudish but there's so many if you get into the research you know so many things that they did that we would be shocked about you yeah. know <laughs> that's right that's right and they're not being satisfied with two series you've got a third that you've started <laughs> a romantic suspense series called the Gothic Mist series with the first book out, Secrets in the Mist. Tell us how that one came about. Well, I have always loved Gothic um, stories. Um, my favorite author is Mary Stewart. Um, and I love, you know, the authors like Victoria Holt. And so I really wanted to get to write a series um, that was, you know, kind of set in in that kind of um, story. And, and, you know, it's not a big... Um, it's not so big now as it was. Um, I think it's having a resurgence, but that's kind of, you know, why I just love it. It's kind of getting to just dabble in something that I'm really interested in. Sure. Yeah. And you'll see, you'll see that one as also having quite a reasonable amount of longevity. Have you got any idea at this point how many books you might be planning for that one? Well, I have at least ideas for uh, three more. So I'm hoping that it's at least four books long and, you know, hopefully I'll get more and more. So (laughs) I'm kind of, I was kind of open-ended at the moment, but I do have ideas for four, for three, three additional stories. And the second book should be releasing next year. Fantastic. Look, um, just turning back to Lady Derby for a moment, because that it is so strongly located in the border country. Um, If you were going to organise a magical mystery literary tour for the Lady Derby series, where would you suggest that people go? Is there a a sort of area or region and key towns that you would think would recommend they could visit? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I would... I've had authors, or excuse me, I've had readers ask me about putting together a little map, and I would love to do that someday of all the key spots. Yeah, um, I would definitely say, you know, going through the books, um, the highlands in the, you know, the western highlands, um, like around Loch Hugh, um, is a, a uh, where the first book is set, and then it kind of travels down into um, Loch. Uh, excuse me, the first, the fourth, excuse me, <laughs> um, right there on the, the coast there north of Edinburgh and then in Edinburgh. And then of course the border region, um, and, uh, Kira's, um, childhood home I have located. It's right on the border with, um, between Scotland and England. She actually lives on the English side of the river Tweed, but it's right there, um, almost in Scotland. <laughs> and, um, then they end up in the um let's see the lake district there's some scenes and which is just so gorgeous and they do end up in ireland uh, just south of dublin for book 5 oh, yeah, and then down into um to dartmoor um into western dartmoor and then they're in london for book um 7 which comes out next year so oh gosh they do it'd be, it would be quite a twip yeah. it would be quite a twip to do them all <laughs> That's right. Yes, they go to Ireland for with Gage's family um, uh, interests, don't they? Well, no, it's th- that's separate. And then, uh, well, his father um, asked them to undertake this investigation, yes. and yeah. they end up back in um, at Dartmoor for his family, oh, okay. his, his grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes, you should put that map together sometime. I think it would be <laughs> great for people to see. And when you mention her house on the Tweed, is that a real house that people could? see is there an address that you've got in mind it is not the village um i kind of made up the house yeah a lot of my houses are based on real houses or they're although i although a lot of times i change the names 
um, you know, just because I, it's not always easy to get all the details right. And so yeah. I, I don't, yeah. I, if I have to fudge it, I change the name just for, you know, accuracy's sake. Um, but they're always based on places. But for Kira, I, I decided I wanted her house to be completely fictional. Um, the town um, is actually, I changed the name, but it's called Carham. Um, I'm probably saying it wrong, but it's C A R H A M. It's right there. Yes. Um, so you can drive through. I drove through that village. Um, when I was in Scotland and England, it was just kind of a random village we drove through, and I it just kind of I don't know. I liked it. It was <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was something about it. This little village um, and its church and that, and so I just decided to adopt it as um, Curious Childhood Home. <laughs> And and if you did actually choose a real house and let people know what it was and it is privately owned, there, there could in the future be inconveniences for the um, current owners. Correct. There? Correct. <laughs> people they collecting could, yes. around the gate, taking <laughs> photographs and things. <laughs> so it feels like, you know, it's kind of respectful to change it a little bit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Look, turning to your wider career, is there one thing you've done perhaps more than any other that you'd credit as giving you the success that you've enjoyed? Oh my, good question. Um, I, well, I think for me, a big part has just been, I learned, I I heard from somewhere long ago that you can't fixate on a lot of things. You kind of have to let them breathe and be. Um, and the, the biggest thing as a writer that you can be doing to help your career is to write more books. Yes. Um, and so I've, tr- I've chosen to do a lot of my focus to, to put a lot of my focus on just writing and, and continuing to grow and to continuing to, you know, have output. Um, and, and so, you know, the more books you have, the more backlist you have, the more chances you have for someone to pick it up. Um, and then I kind of have to just let the, the rest be, I would say. Um, um, but I would say that's been kind of the key for me, just doing that. Um, you know, if you have a book and you focus too much on that one book and then, you know, then after they've read it, there's nothing else they can turn to. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, I think my biggest success has been that, uh, that's what I've, you know, I, that's helped me a lot. Um, so yeah. Sure. And you are traditionally published, I, I believe, aren't you? But several different publishers? I am. Yes. Yeah. And is that been is that that's obviously a choice? You wouldn't be, be it is yeah. You wouldn't be tempted to go indie at this stage, or do something indie. I I am doing uh, the Gothic Myth series is actually technically self published. Oh okay um, yeah. yeah yes um but yes I have I have three other publishers for things but um yeah the Gothic Myths I chose to self publish because I did want to try that avenue, um, because it's been so successful for so many people. And it's nice to have different streams and different, um, you know, to di- di- diversify, you know, to not only be relied on publishers. Absolutely. They say that the best position of all is to be what they now call a hybrid author, isn't it? To have it doing both. Yes. I've heard that too. And, and I've seen that, you know, I've seen kind of proof of that. Yeah. Look, you majored in music at one time and you jokingly say in one place that you had the ambitions to be another Amy Grant rather than a Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you still enjoy your singing. Does that come through in your books at all? I I think it does, um, just from the sense that um, the arts is really important to me. Um, and, you know, I chose to, to make Lady Darby a portrait artist for a reason, um, other than just that being an, you know, a portrait artist, she would be good at examining people's features, you know, and reading their expressions. Um, it's more of a mindset. And I kind of have that, you know, musician artistic mindset and it carries over, you know, into different forms of art. And so that part leads through obviously, but also I think there's a rhythm in language and writing and it, it's the same as in music at all. It's, it's a flow and a rhythm and a, uh, you know, a, a way of looking at things. Um, and I would say that definitely interplays. What do you like to do with your music these days? Uh, for me now, it's just more fun. Um, you know, I don't do anything professionally at this point. Um, you know, just, you know, singing in church and, um, you know, with my kids and, uh, just enjoying those kind of things. And what's your taste in music? Oh gosh. Uh, it's pretty varied. Um, Right now, I've been listening to a lot of um, soundtrack music. That's what I prefer to write to, and I'm on deadline, actually. So, oh, great. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of writing. Um, 
but I, I prefer, you know, either classical music or um, soundtracks that don't have vocals to them because the the words distract me when I'm writing. But um, I, I love the instrumental music. That helps me a lot. Sure. So what soundtracks are you listening to, write, writing to right now? Are you Can you name a couple of them? Um, I got to think about this. Um, let's see. It's funny. Some books end up having a soundtrack that kind of overtakes and becomes the tone of the book. And then other books, it's kind of like I just listen to a conglomeration. Um, like, for example, Inception, the Inception soundtrack is was really big for mortal arts. That's Whenever I hear that now, that's what I think of writing. <laughs> um, and for Treacherous the, is the Night, actually, the Dunkirk soundtrack was kind of what what I listened to a lot when I was writing it. Uh, now I've been listening to a lot of, well, it's funny. I've been listening to a lot of the James Bond soundtracks. Um, (laughs) let's see, uh, the imitation game and, um, the, um, Oh, what is that called? Um, the Penny Dreadful soundtrack, um, some things like that. <laughs> Look, this is really fun because one of the authors that I spoke to just very really recently, Timothy Hellinan, was saying that he puts in his books at the at the end in the little notes thing, he puts down the music he listened to while he was writing that book. Oh, really? And he gets <laughs> lots of feedback from readers suggesting other music that he could be listening to. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it is fun. It is fun. I agree with you about um, the non-verbal. Although, actually, one I quite like listening to Il Divo because it's all in Italian and Spanish. And oh it, yes, and it so yes. It, it just washes over you. But it, you don't. It's not it really does. intrusive because it's not your language. It's, but yeah. exactly, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yeah, a lot of the classical music, you know, it's in Italian or other things, and that doesn't distract me because it's yeah. You're exactly right. It's not my main language. Yeah. <laughs> Look, turning to Anna as reader, the series is called The Joys of Binge Reading because in this period that we're living, people do turn a lot to series reads. When they discover a, read, a writer, they want to read the next book. And I'm not, I, I guess that you have been a binge reader in the past because you sound like you were, you've been a reader all your life. So who are the people that you like to read, either younger and, and today? Oh, let's see. My, some of my favorite authors are Mary Stewart. I love all of her, um, I guess you'd call them romantic suspense. They're gothic-y. Um, Susanna Kearsley, um, Deanna Rayborn, um, her um, Lady Julia series is one of my favorites. Um, let's see. Um, Ashley Weaver has a fantastic um, series about um, the Amory Ames series that's set in the 1930s. Um Gosh, I could I could name a lot. <laughs> yes, yeah. T- Tasha Alexander is great, and um, you know Christine Trent and um, Sherry um, Thomas, and yes, uh, yes, no, <laughs> many, many, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, Christine Trent is a name that's been mentioned to me, and and Tasha Alexander is one that you've your work was originally compared with as being if if people like Tasha, they'd like you. So obviously you're in a, in a very similar stable, aren't you? Yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> and I think you're doing an anthology that's about to come out with some of the, the other historical writers, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yes. It's, uh, it's called The Deadly Hours. Um, and it's out, it's due to be out next year. Um, and it's, um, yeah, they're all stories that are based around a, um, pocket watch, um, that through history ends up in different people, ha- people's hands. Um, and it, the, the anthology will be with Susanna Kearsley and Christine Trent and C.S. Harris, all authors that I love to read. <laughs> um, and my story, and it actually is a Lady Darby story, um, funnily enough. So, um, and it's set between the, um, wedding novella and book five before they leave Edinburgh. So that sounds really fun. I must say, I agree with you on C.S. Harris. She was one of the first historical mystery authors that I ever read. And I just adored the Sebastian St. Clair (laughs) series. Just gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Look, we're sort of starting to run out of time a little bit. So looking back over your career at this stage, if you were doing it all again, what would you change, if anything? I think I would tell myself not to worry so much. 
Yeah. I'm by nature a worrier um, and, and I get anxious and I've gotten so much better at it as I've gotten older, letting that go. But uh, I was so anxious to have success and so worried and so, you know, just clinging to everything. Uh, I would say, you know, I would tell myself, I'd go back and say, chill out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy it and, you know, let it be and it will all be fine. And, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, just chill out. Um, you know, and I, I think a lot of people when they're younger are that way. They need that maturity to grow and, you know, to let things be. <laughs> I think probably any writer, there is that feeling with every book of hoping that people are going to really like it and worrying about it and that kind of thing. Yes. So, yes. 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 And I would tell myself, don't read the reviews. <laughs> 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 too many authors you get in there and you see a bad one and it just ruins your day so <laughs> don't read the reviews <laughs> yes yes that's right so what is next for Anna the writer you, you've just got a huge production schedule it seems to me you're writing books for three series so where are you up to in that uh in that production line now <laughs> Well, I'm I am finishing writing the third Verdi Kent series, uh, third Verdi Kent book, which is out next autumn. Um, but next out is um, the book seven of the Lady Darby series, an artless demise. Um, that's coming out on April second, and then. Um, yeah, next year is very busy. The anthology will be out, and also the second Gothic Myths book. So, yeah, <laughs> so. If plans go accordingly, it'll be there'll be four books out next year. Oh my gosh, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, most of them are written. So <laughs> oh, that's great. That's lovely. Look, Anna, it's been great talking to you. Do you interact with your readers online? And if so, where can they find you online? Yes, I have a website, um, AnnaLeeHuber.com, and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, all at Anna Lee Huber. So, <laughs> and and you do you get quite a lot of inter, interplay there. I do. I do get quite a lot of interaction, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I love to to see and hear what people say. <laughs> I have to say, oh, that's wonderful. Look, it's been great talking to you. It really has, and uh, I I really like the sound of that anthology. It sounds a great deal of fun. It was. It's been a lot of fun to work with. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and have a really great day. Thanks. Thanks you t- you too. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Joys of Binge Reading podcast. You can find all the details and links for this episode at www.thejoysofbingereading.com. We'd love to hear your comments and suggestions for who you'd like us to interview next. And if you enjoyed the show, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or a similar provider so you won't miss out on future guests. Thanks for joining us and happy reading. The Joys of Binge Reading podcast is put together with fantastic technical help from Dan Cotton and Abe Raffles. Dan is an experienced sound and video engineer who's ready and available to help you with your next project. Seek him out at dcaudioservices at gmail.com. That's D for Daniel, C for Charlie, audio services at gmail.com or check our show notes. He's fast, he takes pride in getting it right and he's great to work with. Our voiceovers are done by Abe Raffles, another gem of sound and screen. Abe has 20 years of experience on both sides of the camera slash microphone. As a cameraman director and also as a voice artist and TV presenter. I think you'd agree that his voice is both light-hearted and warm. He is super easy to work with, no matter what the job. You'll find him at abe, A-B-E, at pointandshoot.co.nz. As I say, the full details in the show notes on the website. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Hopefully see you next week. Bye.